For tonight, we have Katia Tepper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Katia is from West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, she's had solo shows at The Hand in Brooklyn and uh, Species here in Atlanta. Uh, her work has been recognized in 2016 by the Wynn Newhouse Award. Uh, in 2017, actually right after uh, her mural opened, uh, the wall, the big mural wall that's in the other room, I think, was it the next day? It was like this. Three like, days later. Install it and then immediately took off for McDowell up in New Hampshire for this really amazing residency. Um, uh, she has a BFA from Cooper Union in New York, uh, lives in Athens, uh, Georgia, where she moved to play for the UGA basketball team. Uh, <laughs> that was an incredible shot. <laughs> Your form was. <laughs> uh, if, if you have a chance, take another look. It's still going to be up for a while, but take another look at the mural. It really is when I've invited artists to sort of take on that space, to take on that wall, the, the sort of prompt or the advice is to like, do your practice, do what you do, but try and make, try and blow it up, try and make it big. And she nailed it so perfectly. It's like seeing her work before uh, this massive wall, and then seeing it on the wall. It's it's like everything that that I that we that like has ever been dreamed of. It's perfect. Uh, so we're really excited to hear about it, and thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thanks so much, Daniel. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, I ask that throughout this talk, you keep in mind the title of my installation currently on view. How does the external shape shape the internal shape? Paying attention to how shapes interact through positive and negative space, and also thinking about how the forms in the outside world can shape one's inner world. My work deals with embodied experience and considers how the body acts as a translator of its environment. I'm interested in the porosity of the body, how we are constantly absorbing and reprocessing matter and information from the exterior environment through our orifices, our senses, and our psyches. An obvious example is eating food. We take it in from the outside, it moves through the digestive biological machine, and then re-enters the world changed. I'm excited by the idea that abstraction can be viewed as the end result of a body's digestive process, that what I make with my hands is the culmination of the outside world, penetrating into my body, passing through my internal mechanisms, and leaving my body in new forms. Let me also preface this talk by admitting that my work is, by its abstract nature, very convoluted. Most of what I say with material, form, and color comes from a set of nonverbal concerns. So I'm going to do my best to talk about nonverbal communication, about how thoughts and feelings can be organized and expressed visually. I've decided to structure this talk around how advertising signage specifically has influenced my sense of nonverbal communication and my work as an artist. I'm interested in how the visual language of advertising uses stripped down color and form to manipulate our minds on an automatic level. The way these pervasive rectangular structures jutting into the sky, their logos hovering over the landscape, are intended to be both hyper-visible and simultaneously very invisible. You're not supposed to think about them, just to absorb their effects and in turn desire the things that they sell. I cannot pretend to have a neutral relationship to this landscape. Deep in my gut, I understand that this is not what Earth is supposed to look like. This is not how bodies are supposed to find sustenance. This landscape seems to utterly deny the existence of nature and bodies. When I look at this bizarre installation of giant sculptures, I can't help but see deforestation, global warming, surveillance, addiction, 
diabetes, chemical waste, labor abuse, NRA funds, political control. Every corporation, even the quote-unquote good ones, contribute to this dehumanizing ecosystem. I do not judge the people who work here or the people who shop here. I am, of course, one of them. This is the environment we all share now. So when I see this strange sculpture park that repeats itself throughout the terrain, I recognize inside these structures lies the seemingly benign face of toxicity. I'm going to admit in all honesty that my work operates on a similar level as advertising. I also use simplified color and form and put emblems and rectangles and other shapes. My work, like advertising, attempts to yank at your eyeballs, creep into your subconscious, and elicit automatic associations, moods, and desires. For instance, similar to Whole Foods, I have used the color green on a larger-than-life scale to make your brain think about nature. I have filled a big rectangle with patterns to summon associations with decoration and textiles. I have employed the rounded form of the ceramic bowl, penetrated by raw materials, to talk about the body and digestion. Celebrating nature, the handmade, the deeply interior realm of the domestic, and the facts of the body, its hunger, sexuality, fragility, and inevitable decay. These are some of the values embedded in my advertising. A 1978 essay by the writer and activist Audre Lorde titled Uses of the Erotic, the Erotic as Power, has served as a manifesto to me in recent years. Originally conceived as a feminist call to empowerment, I think this essay can also be applied to the contemporary state of corporate reign over our bodies and planet. In it, Lord says, when we live outside ourselves, and by that I mean on external directives only, rather than from our internal knowledge and needs. When we live away from those erotic guides from within ourselves, then our lives are limited by external and alien forms, and we conform to the needs of a structure that is not based on human need, let alone in individuals. But when we begin to live from within outward, in touch with the power of the erotic within ourselves, and allowing that power to inform and illuminate our actions upon the world around us. Then we begin to be responsible to ourselves in the deepest sense. For as we begin to recognize our deepest feelings, we begin to give up of necessity, being satisfied with suffering and self-negation, and with the numbness which so often seems like their only alternative in our society. So in this earlier work, I was just beginning to process how I might use my work to counteract some of the toxic ubiquity of unchecked consumerism, or at the very least, counteract the numbness in myself by working from what Lord calls the erotic, but you might also call gut feelings. This photo shows a site-specific installation I created not far from here at the Artist Run Species, shout out to Jason, uh, this piece wraps around the corner of the gallery and measures over 25 feet long. At this point in my practice, I was relating most to the external shape of advertising by considering the psychological effect of large scale over the body. The effect of large scale on the body seems to be one of passive absorption. For instance, the physical presence of decoration and architecture encompass and overwhelm the body, so that their effect penetrates long and slow. This photo shows the interior of an Olive Garden chain restaurant, where corporate standards dictate a set of interior design motifs. As a child, eating American-style Italian food amongst the manufactured rustic decor of the Olive Garden is one of my first memories of the external shape 
shaping the internal shape. I still recall how the arched doorways and artificially rustic walls amplified each spoonful of minestrone going down my throat. It was like taking a theme park ride of Italy through my digestive system. As an artist tasked with developing an authentic seeming voice, I consider this aesthetic experience of faux culture super interesting, and I often find myself paying homage to the Olive Garden chain restaurant in my work. A little about my process. I start with drawings that blend intuitive decisions with sculptural planning, considering how something will hang and incorporating that into the design. Working from memory, I conceived of this homage to the Olive Garden sensory experience channeling its arched doorways and rustic grapes logo. I then proceeded to manufacture the design as part of the large-scale installation using hand-built ceramics and mural. I consciously use the term manufacture to refer to my process. I'm trying to reclaim the pleasure of manufacturing from industrial production. So I emphasize the qualities of the handmade and the erotic potential of touching material. Touch is the most direct interface between our bodies and the outside world. Though for most of us, the thing we touch most now is a screen. Learning to be responsive to material is a form of meditation for me. Ceramic preserves touch in a very compelling way and it is also extremely finicky and requires that you listen to it. So my language for working with clay is very informed by what clay tells me to do. But my gravitating toward relief sculpture seems inextricably influenced by the low relief designs of industrially manufactured advertising signage. Of course, these signs are influenced by a history of low relief sculpture in wood, marble, clay, and other materials. Personally, I have more direct exposure to Olive Garden signs and the like than I do to ancient relief sculptures. So these are my main point of reference. In this installation, I was also considering how to create a sense of order out of disparate parts forming a long horizontal composition. The result feels deeply related to the collaged effect of strip mall layouts. I also used a repeated yellow square shape to drive home a sense that the color yellow, the color of sunshine, of egg yolks, is a color that contains a deep sense of vitality. This formal repetition relates to the repeated square of a logo in the landscape, like in this Shell gas station. If you read this installation left to right, it concludes with a picture directly referencing the shape of a sign. The picture space is divided into patterns, again alluding to domesticity, decoration, and crafts. But the effect of the overall picture is meant to read as a landscape with a sign. I was thinking more broadly about signs than just giant corporate signs. It's easy to forget, but corporations are not the only forces communicating with signs. I'm interested in how, when you put a rectangle on a stick, it takes on the physical form of a message. Our relationship to visual information is such that putting text or imagery in a rectangle on a stick is an easy and effective form of communication. We recognize and accept it as automatically as we read body language. Interestingly, when you put a rectangle on a stick, it starts to look like a body or a tree. This is a piece by the artist Sharon Hayes, who I was lucky enough to study with at Cooper Union. She created a sculptural installation using found yard signs for real estate, political messages, etc. Most are printed and some are hand painted. Here is another iteration of Sharon's piece. I love the effect of this installation, how it creates a sprawling landscape of physical messages. Something very compelling about the form of a sign is that it is both painting and sculpture. 
but my project is not about using found materials directly. It's about digesting these found forms into new forms. My allusion to the sign also combines painting and sculpture, though in my version, the painting foregrounds the sculpture instead of the other way around. In my digested version of a sign, written language is reduced to a set of gestural marks made out of clay and paint. I think a lot about mark making as the most basic element of communication. A letter or number is composed of a series of marks. When you take the notation apart, it still retains some of that sense that it's trying to communicate. So I was trying to use brushstroke in such a way that every mark feels like it's trying to say something. My relationship to sculpture is not about making objects that stand. Instead, I use the third dimension as a physical disruption to the flat picture space like these clay forms jutting directly out of the drywall. This is meant to reinforce the sensory experience of touch and bring bodily awareness to the viewer. For my next project, I wanted to continue to use the form of a sign while expanding how I could know a shape by touch. The most good looking signs in the landscape adventurously stray from the simple rectangle on a stick into funky shaped sculptures. People react positively to the organic shape of the Arby's sign. <laughs> it's fun to think about holding it. Partly, I was thinking about how funky shaped signs look against a clear blue sky when I conceived of how does the external shape shape the internal shape. The matte light blue mural references the sky but there is no use of the color green in this piece. This gives the blue a sterile quality, more related to medical aesthetics than the big blue sky above. Like the Olive Garden Italian restaurant, a doctor's office is another environment where the external presence of decoration is notably felt inside the body. The standard color scheme of the industrial medical complex is powder blue and beige. I think these colors are meant to mute the erotic experience of being in a body. In other words, to silence the increased senses that come with embodiment. I'd like to believe the intention is to numb the sick body through decoration so that it will experience less pain. But as a professional patient with a chronic illness, my experience leads me to suspect that the numbing effect of this beige campaign serves as a backdrop for pushing pharmaceuticals, or at least selling you something. At least it's undeniable that the beige of the medical industrial complex bears a striking resemblance to the beige of strip malls and stores. What this beige means exactly, I do not know. I decided to use these supposedly common colors as the backdrop for the hysterical forms in this installation. I also used industrial felt soaked in plaster to create large slab forms. Plaster relates to both the medical world in terms of plaster casts and to the strip mall world in terms of stucco, not to mention drywall. The sign in the middle resides in a clearing like the parting of the seas. This composition was influenced by the landscaping around this gas station sign. I tried to create a sign inside a narrow path, translated into a flattened pictorial mode. My homage to this landscaping is probably not successful. The logic of my picture space is much more related to the flattened space of a smartphone screen design than real physical space. In their own way, there's something comforting about the sculptural presence of signs jutting out of the ground. As much as they try to deny it, they're not infallible to physical conditions. Even though they try to look increasingly like their virtual app counterparts, there's something almost nostalgic about them existing in space at all. Their physical vulnerability stirs in me a feeling not unlike empathy. 
In physical space, they are more than just the idea they are selling. They have exposed structural elements. They are held together by nuts and bolts. My sculptures are also held together with hardware that I made from ceramic. To hold together multiple layers of material and bring dimension, to bring dimensionality and tension. My intention with form is that it can exist on the brink of abstraction and representation, that it can exist as shapes that go in and out of recognition, and that there's more than one way to read them. When I design them, it happens quickly, automatically. With that said, I'll get into some of the specific ideas that I had going in. Inside the bubbly pink shape of this sculpture, there's a red thing on a trunk, like a sign or a tree, and inside of that, there's an apple dissected into four rounded pieces. Dissection felt very fitting for how I was thinking about the external and the internal, opening up a body and seeing the contents of a stomach. The game operation also feels very related to the relief space and content of these sculptures. Part of exploring this convoluted metaphor of digesting the external, bringing consciousness to gut feelings, and considering the plastic toxicity of consumer culture has led to something like an obsession with big fruit logos, like this Earth Fair sign. It has this country classic Americana feeling. That aesthetic seems just as much a performance of culture as the Olive Garden grapes. Using this blurry photo of the Earth Fair tomato feels accurate for communicating the way the fruit logo worked its way into my imagery, more as a memory than anything solid. And back to this idea of nonverbal concerns. It's very hard to describe exactly what you're looking at here with language. I took a flattened, cartoony drawing of a big fruit, dissected it spatially with multiple layers of inverted and extroverted ceramic bowls held up vertically against a flat plane, punctuated the forms with ceramic hardware poking in and out of pigmented epoxy and delicate plaster shapes. The resulting thing that is this sculpture manages to feel, for me, like an accurate account of the truly complica complicated experience I have with industrial food. For me, the experience is cerebral, emotional, and physical. Despite all my criticality, I do truly love the feeling of seeing a big industrially produced cartoon of a fruit on the side of a building, walking in, buying fruit, and eating it. It's all I've ever known. Digesting the external presence of large signs in this iteration produced a 10 foot tall structure, 11 feet off the ground, that is based on rectangles, but strays from the rectangle on a stick. It sort of, but not quite, looks like a letter, as logos tend to but mainly the sheer scale and graphic color scheme lend to it a feeling of advertising, and the beige wall, of course. The design is based on the image of a cracked egg, its yolk suspended in midair. I'm sort of obsessed with the perfect yellow circle that is an egg yolk. Like the best logos, it's both completely ordinary and totally sublime. The egg yolk is a force of life and sustenance that feels like the opposite of plastic, even though it seems almost as alien. Removed from the industrial food system, I have held a freshly laid egg in my hand and felt its warmth and life force. It's a sensation that has completely revitalized my relationship to beige. <laughs> The form my tribute to the egg takes is both earthy and mechanical. My translation is violent. A stretched yellow hide over an organic terracotta set of gears. 
I was thinking of the body as a biological machine with its own complex and intricate functions. Maybe humans designed the industrial world in their own image after all. The same form repeats on the other side of the wall. But in its placement, we understand it to mean something else. Perched up high along the calming powder blue, the yellow circle is not an egg yolk, but a sun. The similarity of egg yolks and the sun is endlessly exciting to me. The sun is one of those forms that, as far as I can tell, all kids draw. When thinking about universal experience, I wonder what on earth is more universal than the cosmos itself and the sun that Earth orbits. This is as good a time as any to bring up something I haven't acknowledged about advertising and brand logos. It's pretty obvious, but worth noting. The nature of the symbol far predates the advent of corporations and the lengths that they will go to to manipulate consumers. I've avoided semantics thus far, because once you get into sign, symbol, icon, logo, it gets confusing to me. But suffice to say, I'm interested in how what began as cave painting eventually made its way into giant structures produced by machines and weird immaterial images we tap on to get food, water, and clothes. I want the things I make to exist somewhere in between cave paintings, physical signs, and digital graphics. I'm gonna wrap this up by sharing some newer work. During and after building these sculptures that are much bigger than me and involve lots of materials, each with their own sensitivities and timelines, I developed a side project of drawing, a way to envision ideas rapidly and with ease. Whereas in the past, I have created drawings with sculptural considerations built into their form and logic, and then worked to manufacture the drawings into material objects that, that relate to the body and their rounded three-dimensionality as ceramic bowls. These newer drawings do not rely on the form of the ceramic bowl and mural to reference the body, digestion, and gut feelings, and the external environment. Instead, they attempt to elicit similar feelings through illustration. Related to medical illustration, the funkiest of funky signs of the vintage variety, and references to country classic Americana textile aesthetics. They are in and of themselves drawings as finished pieces, though I am working on translating some into larger material pieces, which I'll get to shortly. Some relate more to the form of signs more than others. like this upside down sign. And some are just their own thing. It's most accurate to describe them as logos for my feelings. They continue to explore embodiment in different ways. Polka dots are both decorative and biological like a rash or cells. Downturned leaves are a symptom of sickness in plant bodies. Olive garden grapes continue to make an appearance <laughs> as grapes or holes or DNA. Dissected fruit acts as another stand-in for the body.
My project continues to be about making something anatomical without any direct reference to a figure. and sometimes going back to the rectangle on a stick. The image of a cartoonish bottle references the body as a vessel. I like how the image of a bottle can refer to the body as a vessel without the baggage of it being a human body. This hanging body feels more like an animal carcass. When I made this drawing, I was thinking about this poem by Suji Kwok Kim titled Animal Farm or Song of the Colonial Governor, Governor General. Admit it, you hate the body because it can be broken, stabbed, shot full of holes and so you became a butcher. Say the spirit cannot be broken. Say you see better than anyone how fiercely an ox, a hog, a cock fights to stay alive until the end. You wonder how nothing seems to stop this rat, sucking, gnawing through cement walls to snatch scraps of gristle, not knowing what you need to kill or why. Beat it with a shovel, skin slither, pestle of skull and will. Admit it shamed you to cover with dung. To continue to have agency using large scale that attempts to compete with the hovering presence of advertising, I've transitioned to working these out as primarily soft sculptures, which gives me a bit more leeway to make a 15 foot tall piece by myself. <laughs> this piece is in progress, but almost done. The main material is industrial felt, which I was using previously, but never leaving exposed like it is here. Other materials in this sculpture include ceramic, plaster, pigmented epoxy, various fabrics and craft felts, yarn, sewing needles, and quilting pins. None of the fabric in this piece is sewn. It's all adhered with glue and quilting pins as a way to keep a tactile quality related to surgery. I started using industrial felt because it related to how I was working with clay slabs and its flexibility and ease of cutting it into shapes. There are so many qualities that excite me about this material. Firstly, it's wool. It's hair that's been matted down. In fact, felt is considered the oldest textile material. And industrial felt is hair that's been industrial, industrially processed. So it's the body and the industry in one. It has many uses. You could say it's everywhere. And there's an established history of artists using industrial felt most notably Robert Morris and Joseph Boyd. And don't get me wrong, I deeply appreciate both of these artists, but I think they can be considered very male, very matter of fact, in their relationship to the material. Whereas I'm actively trying to engage whimsical, extravagant, outrageous, hysterical, maximalist, cute, decorative, and other qualities historically shamed by men in the canon of art history. Some closing thoughts. This piece was a departure from working directly on the wall, but it still does not sit on the ground like a real sculpture. It hangs from the ceiling like a marionette and floats just above the ground. I'm trying to make it feel like an image in space, hovering in midair, so that it's more about the idea of a structure than an actual structure. Every other conversation I have about my influences, people bring up Philip Guston. So it feels fitting to end this talk on a Philip Guston quote. I suspect what people see as related is our shared wonky line and clumsy form. But the way Guston speaks of the enigma 
is what resonates most for me and what I hope to achieve in my own work. This is a quote I annotated from a larger conversation between Gustin and the poet Clark Coolidge. I don't want something to look as if it can move and be somewhere else. I want it to feel almost, not entirely, as if it's just there forever that way. There's just something about having a single form which is there in a space. There's no movement to speak of visually. It's just there, and yet it's shaking, like throbbing or burning or moving, but there's no sign of it moving. It's like nailing down a butterfly, but the damn thing is still moving around. And this seems to be the whole act of art anyway, to nail it down for a minute, but not kill it. Thank you.